Hello and welcome to the webinar of Food Electronic ISOs. My name is Eleni Stark and I will moderate the webinar today. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our webinar. Our speaker today is our development engineer Laurent Ferkel. He will hold today's webinar on how do I solve EMI problems on PCB level and also answer your questions. Before we start the webinar, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during the webinar. This means that you can't ask us questions via microphone during the webinar. Nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask us questions during the webinar at any time via the chat function. You'll find the chat function in the webinar control panel. Please also indicate the slide number from the presentation in your question so that we can easily relate your question. The slide number is located in the right corner on top of the presentation. The webinar will be about 30 minutes long. The chat questions will then be answered in a question answer session following the webinar. There are 15 minutes in addition scheduled for this. If we can't answer all your questions within the 15 minutes, your questions will be answered by email following the webinar. The recording of today's webinar will be available one day after the webinar on our website within the Navigation Point webinars and also on our Ask Laurent website. And now I'm giving directly to our speaker Laurent Ferkel and I wish you an exciting webinar. Hello everybody, my name is Laurent Ferkel and I'm working for Virtual Electronic the last 18 years and was a development engineer in uh, previous companies and today I just want to talk about some EMI situation which you can solve on PCB level sometimes and I will start with some questions like when you're doing a DC DC small DC DC converter can you imagine that a small DC DC converter can generate sometimes something like a conductor emission just think about it could be happen or not and if you imagine if you do a perfect PCB layout an excellent ground plane without any violation that will be mostly enough to pass all the EMC tests well I cannot imagine that but I think it will be helpful to have a good PCB layout routing and by the way if you're just hunting with a scope some EMC issues and uh, you will see that you have a scope with a bandwidth of 250 megahertz but in the EMC lab you have some levels some peak level at uh, 500 megahertz or the 1 gigahertz can you imagine that with your scope you can hunt them you can find them well this is sometimes very difficult I cannot imagine that somebody can do this finally I will recommend in that case um, whatever to invest a little bit more money in the scope because there are existing scope with 3 gigahertz bandwidth or just maybe spend less money and buy maybe just a spectrum analyzer which is for EMI troubleshooting quite a good thing especially if you have a preamplifier as well and you can use some near field probes or something like that you know when you put any device to European market you have to fulfill at least several regulation whatever is low voltage directive or EMC directive please take care because they are in change some of those they even change in April this year 2017 especially for ESD stuff and any device which have a radio uh, device or RF module you must qualify to the RED which is the directive of 2014 any declaration which you make today according to the law from 2008 or even from the 2004 is not valid anymore they are a change that this was a, a, a time where you can still use it but uh, beginning from June this year you cannot use them anymore so be aware about that just to put the CE logo to the device some people think that's enough this is what the EMC are requesting just notify that the C logo only is not enough you must make a declaration of conformity and even if you make this declaration of conformity this is a quite old one I grabbed from my um, Archie where I had something um, all this law is not more valid anymore today so I hide just the company name to not make them too difficult but anyway you have to think about that um, 
if you just make a declaration and even your boss tell you you're the design engineer you did make this device you must sign it you have to be aware you must be in charge and you have, must have procura to um, sign official paper in name of the company I saw that in the last year statistic from 2016 more like 80 percent was not the EMC level the bad work on the EMC uh, failed it was the wrong paperwork so you cannot go to the woman who cleaning the toilet and say sign the paper because I don't want to be in charge of that even the EMC guy from EMC lab uh, he cannot sign the paper for your company so be aware about how to make this paper declaration if you sell something out of Europe to USA you have to comply to FCC rule FCC doesn't care about immunity whatever if you sell something to Japan, VCCI, Australian CTIC, China CCC, you will see that every civilized country will have a EMC regulation. So you must do something to fulfill all these requirements. This is an example for a radio TV receiver uh, which have to pass this uh, conductor emission measured from 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. You have two levels, quasi-peak averaging. And if you have just a simple uh, flyback AC-DC converter, you can expect something like here. And then you can say, yes, Houston, we have a big problem here. So we have to do something to carry on this noise. The next point, the EMC lab will test that into the chamber for the radiated emission. For the radiated emission, you have, again, two different levels. You have this uh, home um, level, the green, uh, the red line and you have the industrial, the green one, in industrial level it's allowed to be a little bit more noisy, um, but however, even if you think your device you're selling just B2B, just to commercial customer, not to uh, standard uh, home appliance, um, you have to carry on, on the home level as well, because as soon your device can be operated in the office environment, even if it's an industrial customer, office is becomes to be home level so in this case when you have this peak okay that's a problem you cannot say it is past the EMC test it's very important when you start to think on EMC when you when you start to design a EMC um, required device because the design engineer is really the guy who's response and who are uh, have the responsibility how much it will cost because as soon you are just focusing on your function and you reach the prototyping stage and you want to pass the EMC test mostly it will happen that you fail and then you must redesign or you have to put expensive ferrite on the cable or to change the housing to, to make shielded and uh, painted and it's a lot of trouble which can happen uh, during the after the prototyping which will rise the cost normally the EMC thinking should happen in a very, very early development phase before you make your PCB, already on the schematic. When you know that you are aiming to use a 1 megahertz DC-DC converter, then you just have to consider, okay, I have a 1 megahertz DC-DC converter, but this 1 megahertz of third, have a fifth and have a seventh harmonics as well. Do I need to filter these harmonics or this is not my business, this is the guy, EMC guy problem, he has to solve it in the EMC lab. You should think on that and uh, you should not think the EMC guy's problem, the EMC guy, it will just say it's fail or not fail. I will put on some low pass filter in the beginning on the early development already on the schematic and of course this cost, calculate the filter in time, put some additional uh, components would pay it back definitely when you can imagine you are blocking all these different frequency all the harmonics and when you have your first working prototype I will recommend go with your first working prototype prototype into the EMC lab and maybe make not the whole EMC test but just a quick scan and let the EMC guy tell you in which frequency you have to do something additional and can you imagine you go with the first prototyping into the EMC lab and you test your prototype and the EMC guy say, hey, EMC test pass. Can you imagine how it feels for a design engineer to pass the EMC test by prototypes and by the first shot? 
So for the guys who did not have this experience, I wish to have at least once in your life, because you will, be, you will, at the beginning you will not believe it that this is something possible. But when you are do this first time, you will want to have a second time the same experience, and it feels really cool. How you can check this EMC? Well, at home on on own laboratory, it's quite so difficult because you have you need to make some investment. Especially, you will need an EMC chamber. You will need some EMI receivers, an antenna, and even if you have all this investment, which is not so cheap, you have to invest at least something like. 500,000 euro for all this equipment, even if you have this investment, do you know how to measure it? Do you know how is the right setup? So if you don't have a knowledge from the EMC lab or do you don't have somebody who did work in the EMC lab, it will be very, very difficult to check all that, especially according to which law and which declaration. Because of this reason, I always recommend having a, a good contact from EMC lab and try to get their more information as you can. In fact, the EMC lab are testing from two different point of view, emission and immunity. Both emission and immunity are split in conductor and radiated. In fact, it's a very simple explanation. What the EMC guys are in laboratory testing, it's like something like when you're watching your favorite football game and your wife starts to drill a hole with a drilling machine. In the previous era, when we have analog television, you have some picture perturbation, maybe some sound, noise. Today, by the digital television, the picture is freezing or just get the black screen. You don't want to have that. This is exactly what the EMC guys in the EMC lab try to catch and try to avoid it. If you generate a magnetic field, the magnetic field uh, by air is quite very straight line and this is not so influenced. As soon you apply to the magnetic field a ferromagnetic material, this magnetic fields will take this easier way to couple through. Doesn't matter if you have a rod core or a ring core, this magnetic field will be banded and it will concentrate on this material. If you describe the magnetic uh, field into uh, air choke, if you use a just simple air choke, you will use the formula B, it is mu zero times H, because mu R is one is constant. By using a ferrite core, the B, it is mu zero times mu R times H. Mu zero, again, is a constant, vacuum permeability. Mu R by air choke one, mu R in the ferrite. This mu R is called relative permeability or initial permeability. <clears throat> by air choke, if you put more current, you automatically have more H field. If you have more current, you have more H, you have more B. So the induction is very cool and very linear, nice function. By using a ferrite core based inductance, the problem starts to be a little bit difficult because this permeability is a dependent parameter. It depends on material, depends on frequency, depends on temperature, depends on current, depends on pressure, and, and, and. And now you start to hate inductance. Honestly, when I was design engineer, it was the same for me. When I saw in my schematic I have to use inductance, I was designing an explosion safety area and I know it will need aspirin for my head edge because this component do every time something different what I want. Because it not, I did not understand that. First of all, inductor, in the ferrite based or sintered material based inductor are very, very temperature dependent. You have to carry on this temperature drifting because when you measure that in the laboratory, normally 20 degrees Celsius condition, you may see that 20, 23 degree, you may have a permeability of 670. Now you want to qualify your product for minus 40 degree plus 85 degree, you will see at minus 40 degree, the permeability will drop to 500 something. Now you go up to the 85 degree Celsius, is no more 500, no more 700, sometime by 800. You can see now you have this drifting only because of the temperature. The formula is B multiplied by mu zero. Uh, B it is multi, mu, mu zero multiplied by mu R, this function here, multiplied by H. Only just changing the temperature. You have in the data sheet an uh, inductance value L it is 10 microhenry plus minus 10 percent. Test condition, laboratory condition. It means 10 percent laboratory condition you may have a 10 percent tolerance. But if you are going into the climatic chamber, it will be even more worst. You will see 
minus 20 or even more, plus 15. So you have to consider this compensation of this drifting of the inductance anyway, not just the tolerance of the data sheet. Especially if you drive something in very, very high temperature, ambient temperature, you have to carry on this uh, matter when ferromagnetic can change to paramagnetic because we say the Curie temperature are reach. In that point, the magnetic property is dropped to a value which could be, let's now think about, it could be zero or maybe not zero because if I multiply mu zero by zero, everything multiplied by zero is not so much, but we still have the air choke. So it must be mu bar dropped to one. Doesn't matter how long you was out of Curie temperature and how high it was, as soon you cool down, it's mostly no damage at all, and it's come back without any change. Ferrite are sintered up to 1,800 degrees Celsius. So if you want to destroy a ferrite, you have to look for a active volcano and put all this stuff into the lava. But then I don't make me worry about ferrite. How about rest of the electronics? Well, actually, ferrites cannot be destroyed by temperature. To measure this permeability is not so trivial. You need actually an impedance analyzer. Impedance analyzer, you need special fixture, you need special jigs, investment something like 80,000 euro. But even impedance analyzer, when you measure the impedance and tell you impedance is 100 ohm, I would say 100 ohm is nice to know, but it's not enough because it doesn't tell me what is this 100 ohm. Because the impedance, in fact, it is a measured value of root mean square of R square plus X square. So impedance reactance, inductive behavior, and the impedance losses. This is the two area where you have to know which kind of impedance do you have. Because now, if you want to use this inductor to store energy, then you have to know how good is the impedance reactance, how good is the ability to store energy for this core. You can use iron powder core up to maximum 150 kilohertz. Then it start to drop very fast. Until 150 kilohertz, you can use iron core based, manganese zinc core based, nickel zinc based inductance. As soon you are using modern new chips technologies, which the minimum switching frequency is 500 kilohertz, you will see iron powder is not your friend, and you should use manganese zinc or nickel zinc because iron powder core will have too much losses. If you use very high switching frequency, like 5 megahertz or something like above 5 megahertz, even you can build to the 10 megahertz switching frequencies, DC-DC converter, you will see magnetic zinc is above 1, 2 megahertz, is not more reliable, you have to use nickel zinc ferrites. Yeah, this is different cores which we are using for storage inductance or even for flyback transformer or even for old LM series national based 150 kilohertz maximum uh, switching frequency DC-DC converter. Now, if you want to use the inductor not to store, you want to filter something, then you must focus on the losses. And now you can see, aha, this is the reason why at 500 kilohertz, your iron powder core, one, two, three, four, five here, you will have something like uh, too much losses. It's excellent filter, actually. Between 200 kilohertz to maximum 1, 2 megahertz, you can use iron powder core like excellent filter. At 10 megahertz, make no sense. For 10 megahertz, you have to use manganese zinc. You go higher frequency, 50, 60 megahertz, I will start to use nickel zinc material. Nickel zinc above 20, 30 megahertz have definitely much better uh, absorption, and you can talk about maximum between 100 to 300 megahertz, and then start to collapse as well. The absolute limit for nickel zinc ferrite with very, very low permeability, you can reach something like 8 dB at 2 gigahertz. If somebody come to you with a ferrite, super duper ferrite for 6 gigahertz, you know, physically is not possible. And if you believe that, you can start to believe in voodoo as well. This is maybe alternative to EMC. Well, what you can do with these different cores, all these snap-on ferrites or molded ferrite is 99% made in nickel zinc. All this common mode choke for conductor emission, it's made in manganese zinc. We have them also nickel zinc. And all these tristot react switcher where you want to filter them, iron powder core is actually a right solution for that. Now, what happened actually in the ferrite? Because, you know, energy cannot be disappear or put in a parallel universum. We must transform in a different form. In fact, what is happening in the ferrite this uh, electric uh, magnetic field is get transferred into the heat. 
But believe me, even if you use a very, very high sensitive thermal camera and you put to your snap-on ferrite on the cable or to the molded ferrite or the VGA cable or USB cable, you will be not able to see any temperature rise. When one day you will produce a device where you put a ferrite to the cable and you feel that the ferrite start to running hot, then guys or girls, I will tell you, you don't have EMC problem, you have a safety problem and run away fast you can because that is not a joke. Then you don't talk about 10, 20 volts per meter, you go about a couple hundred volts per meter, please switch off the device because this is dangerous. Yeah, actually what happened uh, in the core, uh, it is the Q factor is uh, very different, especially when you are looking for a Q factor, Q factor quality factor, uh, for inductance, you have to take care that uh, for storage, you need a high Q factor for filtering a low Q factor. And normally in the inductance, it is like the Q factor with increasing the frequency, the Q factor is increasing as well until the resonant point. And for ferrite-based inductor, or when we talk about cheap bit ferrites, with increasing the frequency, the Q factor is going down because they are made specially to have lossy area dominancy. Which kind of filter topology or transmission mode we can imagine? Well, first of all, you can imagine that you build a device which is uh, tested in a lab and you get the EMC logo, you have the EMC de declaration and everything works perfect and you have a no limit accession. And you go to the customer, the customer will say, okay, you have to operate with this power supply, which is also CE uh, compliant and also uh, tested and everything. And you couple together with your device and you think CE plus CE. Hmm, what is the result of CE plus CE? Maybe C square or maybe uh, CE double or whatever, uh, but it's no guarantee. So... The only one thing what you can do if you cannot go and say to the customer, hey, your DC DC converter is shitty and make uh, such noise that my uh, sensor cannot be read, then you try to put between the device uh, noise source and your load a filter. This is one of the solution, but sometimes it's not possible. So I would say the only one way it is to increase your immunity of your system much higher like even the EMC law or requesting. The EMC law, it is a minimum request. Always keep in your mind, it's a minimum request and it's not for a guarantee that will work everywhere and always. The most important thing is when you are looking for EMC troubleshooting, it is to recognize which kind of coupling do you have because this coupling can be common mode or differential mode. This is the most first point that you have to know. And if you know that is a common model differential noise, then you can go the next step and find the right solution. How to find out? This is not so easy. I can give you an idea how I'm doing when I'm using a wired system. I take a snap ferrite, I put VCC cable and ground from like a power supply. And if I see that in this snap on ferrite on the plus minus wire, I'm reducing the noise or I increase the immunity. I know I have to find again a common mode interference. Now look to the spectrum from the EMC lab and for the maximum peak try to use a common mode choking for this frequency and try to filter that. If this ferrite did not work at all, it doesn't mean that the ferrite is not a good component or the company which producing this ferrite is not good. It means maybe you have a differential mode interference. And now only for testing, split the wire, put one ferrite on plus, one ferrite on minus, and you will see a change. Again, look in the spectrum and use a cheap bit ferrite in the PCB directly in line, and it will be cheap and a better solution. If you put a snap-on ferrite on these two cables, this is comparable and it is absolutely identical with a common mode choke with a bifilar winding with only one turn. Only if you have one single wire inside and not one more already by two wires or more wires you have always to replace that on the PCB using a common mode choke. But a common mode choke, how it works? Well, a common mode choke works quite easy. We have here a toroidal ring wound in one direction, another side another direction, the same number of turns. And if I apply here a, a data line or if I apply a power supply through this wire, just have to use your right hand rule. Your 
uh, thumb, your, your big finger showing in direction of the current, and the rest of the finger show how the magnetic field have been built. This current goes through him, goes to the load, and the same current must turn back because you have to sold, uh, close the circuit. And now if you put your thumb in this direction and you move the magnetic field, you will see, aha, I have here a current compensation, I have here a magnetic field compensation, and what the signal will see is just the resistance of the wire and maybe some leakage inductance. This is the conclusion for a differential signal, a common mode choke would not be affected too much, except you have a high uh, strain or, or leakage inductance. Now, if you apply a common mode noise, it means on plus and minus wire, the absolutely same common mode noise. What means now? Now, again, use, use your right hand uh, rule and put this direction of your thumb of your finger in direction of the current and then you will say aha uh -huh, I produce here a magnetic field I'm producing here a magnetic field oh now both are in the same direction so it means I will get the full impedance of this choke and will be transferred into the heat this is how it's common mode choke works but very important to realize that if this is plus and this is minus it's not allowed to push this minus to ground plane and then go to the common mode choke and put on the other side again this minus to ground plane because if you put that to ground and you put this pin to ground you make a short circuit of this winding and beginning from that point the common mode choke is a very nice product to get a heavy PCB it's good for the kilo to make it heavier but not for the function anymore so avoid to do some ground shifting or to short circuit this uh, common mode choke the problem is if you go to the EMC lab, they tell you not to use a common mode choke or not to use this part number or this material. They tell you you have to go 40 dB down to reach to, to be compliant. This 40 dB down, it's nice information. Maybe sometimes it's congratulated to you because you are 40 dB above the limit. Uh, but what to do with this 40 dB? The insertion of calculation is quite simple. We learned that in a university, and you will find in every electrotechnical book, it's calculated by 20 times logarithm 10 ZA plus ZF plus ZB divided by ZA plus ZB. What is ZA, ZB? ZA is source impedance, ZB is load impedance. I need the impedance of the filter, so I have to go out of logarithm. This is in uh, exponential. But even to use this formula, I need ZA and ZB. Well, in a university, everything is 50 ohm, very simple. In reality, when you go to your AMC lab and you put your device to the desk and they measure it and they tell 40 dB down, what is the system impedance of your device on the desk? It is also 50 ohm? Oops, what now? Well, many people I saw, especially young engineers, when they have a trouble for EMC, they start to simulate and start to describe this is my noise source, this is maybe my load and between this source and load I will put some inductor and capacitors because for inductor and capacitor you get P spice model, LD spice model, all this S parameter no problem and you can very nice simulate. But honestly, is that possible to simulate a EMC? noise without knowing where it's coming and what is the path exactly or this is just wasting time. My opinion is wasting time. So to use a simulation is nice to have but I don't saw any simulator which can solve until today EMC problem just by software. So you use the formula it's a good starting point, but then you need to use some practical values for ZA and ZB. For ground plane if you come if you connect digital and analog ground together because you separate them, you should have an impedance of ZA, ZB maximum 1 to ohm. Best will be milliohm. Zero ohm would be ideal. It's not possible because to put all this uh, nitrogen, fluid nitrogen into the uh, PCB is quite expensive to keep that at absolute zero degree. So I think milliohm is acceptable, but more like 2 ohm, please. Think about your speaker, if you have speaker at home and uh, have uh, 4 ohm impedance and they can make music and sound, even you don't hear the EMC noise, but it is there if you have a ground plane with 4 ohm. For VCC distribution, power supply, 10, 20 ohm is quite a good approach. If it's a buck, can be even le le less than 10 ohm, but this is a good approach. 
if you have data lines, video clock data lines, just imagine if you're working like in USB port, you can have an impedance of 90 to 110 ohm even. And this is a good starting point to start to examine which kind of uh, filter you will need to have this attenuation. This example, like our EMC uh, level for, for radiated emission for 30 megahertz until 1 gigahertz, and you go to the EMC lab and you make your first measurement and you can say, oh, yeah, Houston, we have a problem. We are exceeding here too much. We have to do something against that. This is the maximum peak. We tried to kill him some way. How much is that? How much we need attenuation? 2021 dB. Okay, cut the PCB. Calculate the system impedance for this whatever power supply. Resolder a component and try measurement. When you go into the EMC lab and you make an EMC measurement on Monday, my experience was that Monday is not a lucky, happy day because Monday ex the expectation is much less like I did think I would offer 20 dB attenuation and maybe I just reach 8. Well, this is my experience, my private experience on Monday measurements. Friday, if you measure, on Friday I have the opportunity that Friday is a quite do good day to make EMC measurement because you're below the limit even you don't have safety margin here. It could happen that you say, yeah, I am below the limit EMC compliant, but ah, yeah, yeah, safety margin is not so good, so I will expect to do something additional. And you can imagine, you go to the EMC lab on Friday, but this is not a simple Friday. This is the Friday before you take your major holiday. So you will take next two, three weeks holiday and you go to make an EMC measurement, you know that from Monday on you're on the beach and you will measure this. Sometimes it could be happen something like that. You can see the device is working and then you will see, my God, what I did that. A special, don't focus on your device, focus on the EMC guy. He will be start to be nervous. He will check if you are if his machinery is working and he will open even open the door of his chamber to see if the EMI receiver is receiving something. That's a good point. Then you can do, I did make an excellent EMC work. I wish to everybody to have this experience. You want to know why? Hmm, why? Well, I put here in a um, Excel sheet uh, different system impedance like 1 ohm, 10 ohm, 50 ohm, and it could happen that you're looking for power supply for the ferrite insertion loss, 22 dB, you will assume you have a 10 ohm system impedance, and for 10 ohm system impedance, you will calculate an impedance of 220 ohm, you will check the ferrite beads, it's a 2 amp ferrite bead, 220 ohm, because in the data sheet you will check that, you will see uh -huh, something like 220 ohm, but you will get much more like you did um, like we say, more than you expect, and it's like our logo, you get much more like you did expect and you will think why, because maybe the system impedance was not 10 dB, no, not 10 ohm, it was 1 ohm and it is not 20 dB, it's 40 dB and the whole bandwidth will be much better filtered. This is a nice happening, but it could happen also in a different way that you assume that you have a 10 ohm system impedance, but it was not a data line, and it was a it was not a power supply, it was a data line, and then you get only just eight dB because hmm, not enough two hundred twenty ohm to suppress to reach this twenty two dB attenuation. So the solution just increase the ferrite in this case from two hundred twenty ohm to one thousand ohm, and then you will have again this twenty dB attenuation. According to the system impedance, you have to check that you, again it's not so easy just to put a ferrite bit you have some time to combine this ferrite bit and build something like a LC filter if LC filter is not enough because it's maybe high impedance but you're not sure how high it is give a second C on the front actually you did build your P filter if you know that it's low impedance or if you see it doesn't matter how you change the capacitor is no change or not a big change go back to your LC give it a second L the T filter were acting now much better and now you can optimize the different ferrite beads to have an overlapping of the frequencies. Please use for capacity, ceramic low ESL, low ESR capacity. And for the inductance, when you do filtering with inductance, try to use chokes, try to use inductance where the manufacturer are made them for low lossy, not high Q factor. And please pay attention of the self-resonant frequency of the used components to not build oscillators. 
This is an example for uh, inrush current. If you have an inrush uh, switch on current, like you charge in front a capacity of 10 micro uh, farad, you have a nominal current of one amp, you choose a 50 milliohm, a small uh, RBC uh, ferrite bead, but uh, Keep in mind that this capacity, until he's charged, he has also an ASR. If you have a car application, like a car battery, 12 volt, you just have to put Ohm's law in, in uh, calculation, and you will consider that you will have an inrush current for a short time, 22 amp, which is a lot. It's 11 times higher, like the nominal current, like the, nomi the maximum nominal current of the ferrite bit. And then it will happen that you start the creepage a process and you will destroy the ferrites. You don't know when it will be destroyed, but it will be destroyed. Sometimes if you have luck, you can even smell it very fast and you can even see what happened to the ferrite. And then you know you need you did something wrong. You did not consider the inrush current. Multilayer are not good for inrush, except you use a special multilayer for inrush current, which have been defined to be uh, possible to apply inrush current. We have this MPSB multilayer power suppression beads which are designed in different way and use different layer structure which can withstand 20 times higher rated current like, like the standard version. They're looking in the impedance quite very similar but they are designed and uh, defined how big can be the pools and how often can be these pools. You can even check that on the, on the website here. Um, different sizes and only this can be used for inrush current or you use a wired bigger component else it will be happen that it would be destroyed. Well, where the EMI noise is coming from? If you have a simple bunk regulator, you can imagine you will have some conduct emission on input, some conduct emission on output and some radiated emission because you you move this charge from this output capacity through a coil to the Input from the input capacity to the output capacity. Uh, I just want to mention I will take a little bit more longer time because I saw that we are already above the 30 minutes. But I think it's it's important to talk about this issue where the noise is coming from and which solution we can offer for that because it's very important if you know the ESR of your input capacity and you know the parasitics from your input with uh, these values you already can pre-estimate which noise you can expect on the input from this buck converter. Additionally, when you look on your uh, scope with the switching node, you will see that you're, you will have in the high frequency a quite resonant circuit because even the diode is not ideal, the output capacity is not ideal, and you will have this overshoot and ringing, this copying recounts of this high frequency resonance circuit, it will have here resonance point. What you can do to use a synchronous converter with uh, emulating an ideal diode, but even this MOSFET inside will have some parasitic, it will have less ringing, but completely to avoid is quite very difficult. Additional, when you have a controller and you have an external MOSFET, you have to take about, uh, think about this path of the back path to the MOSFET, to the IC, to don't use this kind of loop antenna because you have here very fast rise time, high frequency, you should use here kind of antenna matching of PCB level. The best thing is one layer on the top, the same length on the bottom, and then float with ground and put vias. Then you will have a very, very accurate, good PCB routing. A filter for a, a DC DC converter, I would say, according to the switching frequency, you can consider uh, inductance, we should filter the third, fifth, seventh harmonics. But be aware that this inductance cannot be millihenries because if you have here a capacity and you have a millihenry inductance here, he will die hungry because it will be not charged in time. So it must be in concordance which, how big is this input capacity, this inductance could be something from 2.5 microhenry, maximum 47 microhenry to be in time charge this capacity on input. How to calculate this, calcul uh, this uh, inductor value? I have here a simplified formula. If you know all these uh, values, you can reach 320 nano Henry. 320 nano Henry is not a standard value. I would choose the closest one, one micro Henry. For the rated current, again, I will uh, consider efficiency to not, should not be too much uh, affected. So I will say a minimum efficiency of 80%. I would do today nothing below 80% efficiency. 
uh, if you consider now this in your calculation, it will be 1.25 amp for my example. What means in fact this 1.25 amp, the inductor should be not saturated at all. If you have already a saturation, how should this filter work? So it must be in a linear area. If you want to do something better because you have an RF module or something very sensitive from some ripple or something, you can put additional capacity, a ceramic one, 220 pico to 1 nano, low SR, and you put a chip bit for right, 100 ohm to 300 ohm maximum. With this PT decade, you may have a very good input filtering for a buck converter. Now, if it's a bush converter, you can just mirror everything from the buck to the output to the to bush converter because a bush converter must be filtered on output and the buck converter must be filtered on input. As well, for the flyback transformer or flyback topology, the input is very important to be filtered. If you have a problem for common mode noise, well, all these different filters, what I showed you before, it is for differential noise. For common mode noise, I would suggest use a sector wound common mode choke because a sector wound has a nice leakage inductance and you can use two different capacity like 10 nano, 100 nano, and with this leakage inductance you may have differential filtering and with a common mode choke you will have always a nice filtering for common mode noise as well. But avoid the ground shifting. Some layout recommendation as well. This is a bad thing to do a T-filter like this, a long path to the ground for the caps. Even if it's correct connected, it's not the right way. I would suggest to use a capacity after the pad directly grounded to the ground plane. Better use two wires to ground them because one single wire is already 0.5 nano Henry inductance. About this insertion for gigahertz filtering, if you don't have to filter anything, Above gigahertz, I would not need to do this, but for gigahertz filtering, you will need to do on every capacitor. This is a, also a bad example for tracking the common mode choke with some uh, input capacity. This customer has some noise here. We, he put this capacity and common mode choke, and then he still failed on the EMC uh, issue. Then it was very squeezed pro product, I, I can remember, and it was a change here. Again, he's failed because this short distance already for the noise was enough to jump to the common mode noise and finally with the third redesign only just because of the PCB uh, design he did pass the EMC test and it was something remarkable to see how much wrong you can do with the banked PCB tracking in case of using uh, not this common mode truck right way. For the buck convert another example under the uh, storage inductance to track the feedback it's not a clever idea even to use a, a shielded inductance. You will have here something like a transformer. This feedback line is very, very sensitive from air sense and uh, it would be better to use far away from the inductance and even not place ground plane on the same PCB level under the inductance. If you use a Four-layer inductance, my personal uh, experience was layer number two, VCC, layer number three, use ground and put the dirty on the layer four and some sensitive on layer one. It's a good solution. Uh, I had always a nice uh, experience with that. There are different uh, theories how to use these ground layers. The best thing if you have like six layer to use between two ground layer to hide the sensitive signals and this is really like a coaxial. By four layer you can try the internal layer VCC and ground and not violate too much the ground. It's also a good solution. Design tools which you can use. This is our Red Expert. If you go on this link, when you will download the PDF, you can just click on this Red Expert. You can have the opportunity to ch to change different currents and uh, even voltage when you calculate your storage inductance for the ferrites. You can put different frequency. You can change the impedance uh, system. You can even see what means the DC premagnetization. They are in Red Expert already all this data for the DC BIOS load on the chip bit ferrites and you can see how much the impedance will drop if you put the maximum current or if you have your standard nominal current. 
In LD Spice is also there are models. If you download the LD Spice and from our website we have this library. Some of the components are already in the library of LD Spice. If you don't find every components on our website, if you click on the toolbox, you can download the latest library from Virt Electronic with the transformer models, Gbit write independency of the current and also a lot of different other inductors as well. More information you can find in this book, Stilogy of Magnetics or LT Spice book. Please ask my colleagues and in, in the local salespeople which is in contact with you. If not, just send us an email and we we'll get in touch with you. You can get this book from different applications. And now it's time for the questions. Now I will check which questions we have put inside. So let me check this. So one question. When I work with a common mode choke on PE, where to connect it to? Primary or secondary? Uh -huh. I always connect it to the primary. Well, a common mode choke and PE, it is quite very difficult. Honestly, when I have um, ACDC converter and I use a common mode choke. I use common mode choke only just for the line and I don't put PE through the common mode choke. PE is separately. This is for the shielding, for the cage, but not for the ground on primary. Uh, of course, if you use Y caps, you can put Y caps to PE as well. Um, be aware about the leakage of the current. This should be not too big. But honestly, normally it's always on the primary side. Another question. How about when I use an electric module, radio module, on my design, which is completely tested CE sign? Do I have to check in my final design also again? Well, if you have a design which have been tested for EM, in, in EMC lab without the RF module and you pass the EMC test and you add this module to this device and uh, this device would work with this RF module together, you must test the device together with the RF module again because then you are not anymore just EMC, low voltage or whatever, you must test for the RED, radio emitting device. This is another uh, test method and it's included the CE as well, but definitely you have to pass again the EMC test, definitely. Another question just come in from somebody. Just like it is mandatory to have an enclosure for a custom-made EMI filter, 3 times 400 volt, 30 amps. If it is mandatory to have a custom-made enclosure for a custom-made EMI filter, I think you are you are meaning this this shielding for the EMI filter, which are many companies who are making this EMI filter, they put always in the metal box. No, it is not a mandatory. You don't must put in a metal box. Uh, they are putting in a metal box because they use the metal box also like a ground, like a PE ground, and this is the only one reason. Uh, you don't need to put that in a special shielding box or something like that. It's much better if you make the right routing that you consider the common mode choke uh, like one side is a noisy area and the other side is a filtered area to keep the distance more as possible to each other. Sometimes I saw design where even the ground plane was under the EMI filter, not rooted at all to not uh, give the possibility for this noisy area or this, this burst impulse to couple into the ground because the ground was uh, internal ground and it was uh, own not connected ground to outside. Another question. Vias are not recommended for power trace. Any technique if we suppose to use via for a trace? For power trace, via, yes, is not the best solution. It is, in fact, um, track uh, through the VIA's power, if you have high power, is not the best solution. If you have 
low power is mostly not a problem but if you do that with a track uh, if you go like from one level to other level and you will use via I will use a lot of vias like a thermal via you know this uh, like Switzer cheese with many 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 vias to be sure that I'm keeping a low impedance and low DC resistance um, this is only one thing what I can suggest uh, for power tracking through the vias. I think we have some other question which I will respond by email separately as soon you are registered always with the email I will send you a response by email is no problem but because of the time I am really uh, 20 minutes above so it was planned a little bit shorter but I hope you have some nice ideas what to use and uh, I hope you know that DC DC converter are generating some common mode and differential sometimes and the scope is not a helpful tool always to carry on high frequencies and maybe next time you will use the spectrumizer as well and if you still have question for EMC the most important thing in EMC it is to never give up it's always a solution it's always a way maybe you just not see today or not see it right now but it's always a possibility ask the guys from the EMC lab what they would use if they would be in your position or ask our colleagues uh, FIE colleagues we always try to give you uh, some ideas some helpful tools or to try to give a hand to solve this problem it's always a solution the problem is you should not never give up and don't worry even if you are worldwide located somewhere uh, we are locally present with our salespeople we are more like 600 salespeople worldwide and if you just need the help just ask our colleague in sales and they will contact you to the FIA whatever and try to give you a good chance to solve the problem this is where I'm sitting right now in the headquarters in Waldenburg it's a really nice area and so uh, countryside but it's nice view to the little mountain and if you want to keep in touch with me I have also a Twitter account and also LinkedIn you can just contact me directly on this email address as well and I will try my best to give you in a short time as possible a response and even if you look on uh, our YouTube channel you will see some nice tutorials and if you have any idea for a nice tutorial I'm very open and very uh, happy if you give me some idea what you want to see next time so now I will say goodbye and thank you for attending to my webinar and maybe we will meet us in the next exhibition somewhere or a next uh, live seminar by eye to eye I will say and uh, see you next time so bye bye